this morning. Uh, we're going to continue. We're going to talk a little bit about discipleship today. I want to talk about this priority in 24 of passing on the faith from one generation to the next. And quite honestly, as I speak about that today, um, <clears throat> I am hoping that you who may have littles in the home would really be thinking about it in that particular context. I recognize that um, this is a subject matter that goes so much bigger and beyond that. It's not always that we have littles in the home and uh, these, these very, very uh, critical years uh, when we're together and we're with them. Uh, but if that is you, you have the littles in your home, which many in the church body do. Um, my hope and prayer is that you would be thinking about it in that context, what it looks like for you to be someone who passes on the faith from one generation to the next. Maybe that's not where you are. Um, maybe that's not where you are at all. Maybe they're out of the home. Maybe they, maybe they never came. Uh, whatever reason, it may not be there and stuff. But you may be thinking about what it looks like for you to be a disciple maker, as the scriptures are going to call it, and uh, one who is faithful in passing on the faith from one generation to the next. That could be kids' ministries. You saw many of them here this morning. Student ministry out there at work with friends or with neighbors, some older, some younger than you, whatever that may be, that we would be a people and a body that is committed to passing on the faith from one generation generation to the next. A few years back, as, as Kristen mentioned, preach through foundations, and these are going to be our foundational uh, beliefs, practices, and virtues uh, to help us know what it is to know God really, really well, do what he calls us to do, and become like him in everything. We used this image when we talked about re- uh, discipleship a few years back that I want to keep in front of us. I know we've used it a little bit before, but I want to keep it in front of us, and it's really that of, I, I kind of use this picture of 2016, the 4 by 100 relay team, and this image of passing the baton from one person to the next, if you guys remember this. I don't know if you guys remember those Olympics in 2016. Um, It was a really weird year for us because both of the teams were really expected to be dominant. The men were expected to get second place, which is about as dominant as you can hope when you don't have Usain Bolt on your team. You know what I mean? But um, it was a fantastic year, and it was a weird year for us because Allison Felix and our women's team, they were the dominant team in the world. Allison Felix was the greatest um, uh, sprinter on our team. And they had this colossal mistake in the prelims where they dropped the baton, the pass off, and everybody's looking at it going, oh my gosh, we're doomed. We're not even going to medal this year. I can't believe that that actually happened. Fortunately, they were able to protest it, bring it back, and it was able to come back and they were able to rerun. And they ended up did winning. Uh, they did win the gold that year. Uh, but the men weren't as fortunate. I don't know if you remember this about the men in 2016. Again, f- favored to win second place, which is great when you're not the Jamaicans that year. Uh, the race goes on, and they actually get third place in the race. Not only do the Jamaicans beat them, but the Japanese beat them that year. And then they get to the end of the race, and it turns out that they too botched the handoff in that race and were actually disqualified from the whole thing. And so when those Olympics were done, like everybody's kind of reminiscing and thinking about it. They're going, how did that happen? How did these two incredible teams, uh, the, 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 the greatest collection of individual talent, uh, arguably anywhere in the world, greatest even compared to the Jamaicans, individual talent and collection being there right there, how in the world did they not win the gold? And beyond that, like how did they not only get beat by the Japanese, by the uh, Jamaicans, but how did the Japanese beat them when the slowest runner on the American team ran a 9.83 100-meter dash, <clears throat> and there wasn't one person on the Japanese t- team who could crack a 10-second 100? And they're sitting there going, how in the world did the, did the Japanese win it? And there's this article that comes out, and it's fantastic. It said this, despite the surprise factor of the Japanese team, their success didn't come out of nowhere. It was the result of years of biomechanical data analysis uh, with meticulous attention paid to the handoff. And since, adumpt- since adopting the underhand baton exchange in 2001, the Japanese have been one of the most consistent teams in the world, placing in 10 out of 12 world finals between 2001 and 2016. In comparison, Jamaica's placed in 9 of 12. The Americans have placed in 6 and 12 uh, while being disqualified from two of those. Uh, And so what the article continues and wraps up, they say this, what the Japanese have figured out is the art of the handoff, and that all of their training and that all of their individual speed would count for nothing if they couldn't figure out a way to quickly and successfully pass the baton from one person to the next. And so I'm titling the message today, The Art of the Handoff, because I don't think it's a stretch to say that we've got a handoff problem in the Big C Church today. That we struggle with this whole concept of discipleship, that we struggle with being successful, not talking about it, not so much, but, and not telling people about it, not wanting it, 
but actually being successful in passing on the faith from one generation to the next. I mean, when the fastest growing religious designation among people under the age of 30 is that they have no religious affiliation, um, it means that there's a handoff problem in the church today. Uh, when 65% of people over the age of 65 say that they closely follow Christ, which is fantastic, but that number dips to 35% between the ages of 35 and 64, and then it dips again down to 15% between the ages of 24 and 34, and then it dips again down to 5% between the ages of 16 and 23, um, what it means is that we've got a handoff problem in the big C church today. When Barna is telling us that the percent of Gen Z that is now openly identifying as atheist, not even trying to conceal it anymore, but saying, I believe there's absolutely no God whatsoever, is more than double that of any other generation and the rest of the adult population, or that 58% of teenagers and 62% of young adults under the age of 30 all agree that there's many paths to eternal life, nothing distinct or unique about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and they believe things like what's true for me doesn't have to be true for you, or that you can't really be wrong about anything as long as you genuinely believe that it's true, which 15% of boomers and 35% of Gen Z uh, actually believe. Uh, church, it's not a stretch to say that we've got a handoff problem in the church today. And so the question I want us to think about is what would it look like for you and me to do the best that we possibly can? And I think that's all that we can say, to do the best that we possibly can by God's grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit working all over this place to make sure that that baton is not dropped as we pass it to the next generation. What would it look like for you and I to pass it on well? Uh, it's what Paul's going to be talking about in our passage today in 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you're not familiar with Paul's letter to Timothy right there, uh, their relationship goes back quite a long ways. And that's where we're going to be. We're going to be there in Psalm 78. Um, but their relationship goes back quite a long ways. He's writing this letter to Timothy uh, somewhere around 67 AD. Uh, they known each other for about 18 years at this point in time. And so they got to know each other 18 years prior. Paul's out on a missionary journey in Philippi. Timothy was already a believer because he had a faithful mom and a faithful grandmother, uh, much like we saw earlier this morning, this beautiful testimony of a grandmother uh, who was just faithfully passing on the, 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 the faith to her grandchildren, and uh, that story was absolutely incredible. But with Timothy, that's a story, faithful mom, faithful grandmother, passed on the faith to him. He meets Paul, they develop a friendship, and Paul invites him to come and to join him on these missionary journeys. And so for the next 13 years, they're traveling the world, they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ from around 50 to about 60 AD. Um, about four years prior to writing this letter, uh, Timothy stays back in Ephesus, and they plant, actually the, the church has already been planted, but Timothy stays behind to be the first pastor of this church there in Ephesus. And it's not like a church in Dallas that's the Bible Belt, and there's safety, and there's you know, you're kind of in the norm if you go to church here in Dallas and kind of 21st century America today. Uh, these are the first believers ever. A lot of persecution, a lot of difficulty, a lot of opposition, a lot of, hey, you're the weird one who's actually following Christ in this day and age. And so Timothy, along with Paul, Paul's writing from prison and uh, has been in prison many times for the crime of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is going to be Paul reaching out to his friend and his fellow disciple in Christ, his partner in the ministry, and he's going to be encouraging him with these words and so that he can continue to press on in the faith. And so here's what he says beginning in chapter 2, and I love this. He says, you then, my son, beginning in verse 1, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in it. In other words, what he's saying is, hey, you've got to hold on to it, not just know it, but you've got to believe it. You've got to live it out. You've got to be strong in this grace. I don't know if you can imagine what it would be like to say, hey, be strong in the grace while you were sitting there unjustly imprisoned for the crime of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not thinking about vengeance, not thinking about um, getting the best of the other people or, or uh, decrying all the wrongs that have been happening against you or anything, but he's saying, hey, at the top of your mind, what needs to be there? He's saying, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he continues in verse 2, and he says, and the things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, he says, and trust these things to reliable men who will also be able to teach other people. And trust these things is the word that he uses right there. In other words, don't just deliver it out there. 
don't do only what I'm doing right now, which is delivering the message, delivering the good news, throwing it out there, hoping that people grab hold of it. We've said before that delivering the gospel, delivering the message is kind of like the the t-shirt cannon guy at the Mavs game, right? I don't know if you guys remember that. If you've ever been to a Mavs game, you know what I'm talking about. They cram these t-shirts and the t-shirt cannon. They shoot it out there. It goes into the crowd. And uh, the guy's just sitting there going, man, I hope somebody gets that. And I hope it happens to be the right size. And I hope that they like it to the point that they want to put it on and actually get good out of that t-shirt and put on that t-shirt and wear it on any given day. He's saying, don't just deliver it and just hope things go really, really well. Don't just hope that, hey, by bringing your kids to church or by showing up every now and then, that all of a sudden it's going to take root and you're going to live this life in Christ that he's intended for you to live. And the thing's going to go well for your kids and all these things. He's saying, no, 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 don't be one who just delivers it, be one who entrusts it. Entrusting being this word that is much more like uh, someone entrusting a diamond ring to um, a bride on, uh, you know, when they're getting engaged or something like that. We've used this image before. It's the thought process of I'm spending a lot of money on this diamond ring, and I'm taking a lot of time to plan out how it is I'm going to ask this person to marry me. And then I'm going to go to the trouble. I'm going to get down on a knee and I'm going to have this great speech prepared. And then she's going to say yes. And you're going to jump up and you're going to celebrate. And you're not just going to toss the ring at her and be like, great, that was wonderful. Hope you get it. Like you're going to take that ring and you're going to carefully place it on her finger. And you're going to make sure that she gets that ring and that she clearly understood the question you were asking her. There's no confusion about what it was you were doing that day. And that you're going to be clearly on the same page about what it is you are asking her to join you in for the rest of your days. He's saying, don't be a people that just deliver it and throw it out there. Don't be a people that just throw the bumper sticker on the back of your car. Don't be the people that shop at Hobby Lobby and think that the word art on the wall is going to do all the work for you. Don't be those kinds of people that wear the t-shirts of bad slogans from the 80s that make no sense to anybody even inside the church. Don't be the people that just deliver it, but be the people that go the extra mile to entrust it and to make sure that that generation is grabbing a hold of it, and that they're not just knowing about the things of God, but they're knowing Him, and they're following Him, and walking in the ways of God, and then becoming more and more like Him in everything. And that's exactly what he's talking about right here. Be a people that are making disciples, that are going to be making more and more disciples, that are going to be making more and more disciple, making disciples along the way. Because that's how you go from less than uh, 500 believers right after the resurrection to nearly 30 million believers in the next 300 years. It is men and women and children growing up and passing on the faith from one generation to the next. It is not just Peter, James, and John, and Mary, and the original apostles and disciples that are doing all the work. It is them passing on the faith to their children and to their children's children and to the people like Cornelius and Barnabas and Gamaliel, who are the actual disciple makers of the apostle Paul and Philip, who continues to preach the gospel and teach it no matter all the persecution that's happening around him. And women like Dorcas, who continue to invest their lives into other widows and caring for people who are overlooked by the world. And people like Lydia, who are willing to host the very first church plant in Europe. And so Paul's saying, hey, don't let the word of God, don't let the gospel of Jesus Christ, don't let the faith stop with you. Don't let it end with your family. Don't let it end with your name. Don't let it end with you and what you personally experienced over there. Paul's saying, everything that you've heard from me, Everything you've heard me teach, everything you've seen from me, very similar to what Jesus says when he says, go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing and teaching them everything that you've heard me say. He says, everything that you've heard me say, not just the nuggets, not just the Instagram quotes, not just the little bumper sticker quotes and things of that nature. No, no, no. Everything that you've heard me say, he says, pass it on to the next generation, not in delivery mode, but in entrusting mode so that people can know him really, really well, do what he calls you to do, and become more and more like him in everything. And so Paul says this to Timothy, and he reminds him of this original command right there, and it almost sounds like it's kind of this really, really easy thing, right? He almost makes it sound like, hey, all you got to do is just teach them, throw it out there, put it out there, and then all of a sudden it's going to be entrusted. They're going to get it. They're going to live it. God's going to be glorified for generations to come. I was reminded of going to a conference a long time ago, and, uh, and uh, one of the missionaries was kind of getting up there, and they were sharing a new discipleship curriculum, which I'm all about, discipleship curriculums and everything. Uh, nevertheless, he was up there, and he's saying, hey, here's how you reach a community. Here's how you change the world. Each of you just takes four people, and then you go and you walk through this curriculum for the next six months with them, 
and then you get, send them out, and they go and take four people themselves. And then those four take four, and those four take four, and it keeps multiplying, 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 and that's how you ch- a community has changed. I remember sitting there kind of going, okay, that's, like, I get the math, right? I, I understand the math of that thing. However, it's not exactly how faith works, because faith isn't grabbed hold of, and faith isn't really entrusted only by our words. It is entrusted through the time and the intentionality of our lives. In other words, it's not just six months, boom, you can go spread it. It's not just, hey, here, let me teach these things, and boom, you'll latch on to it, and I'll grow and I'll change, and I'm going to grab hold of the gospel of Jesus Christ and all these other kinds of things. The faith comes by hearing, which means that you've got to have it taught, and you've got to see it lived in order to actually believe it. And this is where it gets really, really tricky because it's messy. And because we don't get to say, hey, here's the mathematical formula for how to duplicate everything, how to perfectly do it right with your particular kids. If you've noticed that some kids come to faith very early on, it seems to be easy. They believe. Other people tend to rebel. They need to, hey, like they're going to challenge everything. And it's not always as easy as it sounds. It gets tricky because some of us also are really good at the words and we're really good at the teaching but you may not necessarily be good at the living part of things. And this is where the hypocrisy problem is going to come in. And maybe you hear this in a lot of the Barna stories and a lot of the exit stories of people leaving the church body or being interviewed about, hey, why are you not coming on into the church? Why are you not uh, latching on to the faith? Your parents, you were raised in this Christian home. You haven't grabbed hold of it. So what is it that you're rejecting? And overwhelmingly, the thing that's going to keep coming up over and over and over again is the hypocrisy problem. It is a group of people that they are grabbing hold of and seeing, and they're saying, you know what, you're saying a lot of the right things, and you're saying a lot of things that don't necessarily align with the truth of your life. And what Paul's saying here is don't be one who just delivers it by words, but also live it off. Our priority and calling is to entrust the faith, which isn't just a teaching, it's a living. And so there's some of us that are great at the teaching and the speaking and the telling part of things that aren't so great at the living part of it. And then there's others that are great at the living. I don't like the teaching. I don't like the speaking. I don't like this kind of thing over there, but you're great at the living part of things. But the problem is you believe things kind of like, we've talked about this one before a number of times, like I preach the gospel at all times, but I only use words when necessary. You've heard that kind of mantra right there, which is great in order to say that, yeah, you live out the gospel, but it's been taken to mean so many times that, you know what, uh, I don't really need to say anything. Just need to be a really good person and live it out really, really nice. And of course, the problem is the gospel is a message. It is good news about where to find life in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so a lot of us are good at the living part of things, but we've never had the courage or the ability to step up and to say, hmm, let me teach you a thing or two about the truth of God's word and what it looks like uh, to follow him and who he really is and what faith looks like in the middle of these things. And so Paul comes and what he's saying in the middle of this entrusting command right here is that we would be a part of a both and kind of a discipleship. This, hey, we don't just deliver it through our words, but we entrust it by teaching it and faithfully living it out, which, of course, does not mean perfection and getting it perfect all the time or anything like that, but it does mean that we are faithfully walking in it and living it out honestly and vulnerably in front of other people. Um, Otherwise, you lose all credibility with it. And so I think a great way for us to think about this is is to say that we teach the faith so that they can know it, and then we live it so that they can believe it. And I think we kind of get that the both of them work together, and we have to have kind of both of them working side by side always. We teach the faith in order to know it, and then we live it out, not the only reason we live it out or anything like that, but we live it so that people can believe it, so that people around us in our home, they can see it and be like, that's what we're talking about when it comes to grace. That's what we're talking about when it comes to unforgiveness. This is why they worship. This is why we see the hands raised or whatever it may be in this worship experience. We're seeing the teaching and the living coming side by side always. Uh, It's what the psalmist is talking about in Psalm 78. And this beautiful psalm where Asaph, who happens to be um, a priest and a teacher during David's days at this point in time, he writes this in Psalm 78 verse 4. He says, tell them about his faithfulness and the glorious things that he's done. When he talks about them, he's talking about the next generation. And the reason we know that is because he talks about that here in the psalm. But he says, tell them about his faithfulness and the glorious things that he's done. Tell them about his power and the wonders that he's performed. Tell them about his work word and how he decreed statues for Jacob and established laws in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. And I love that part right there because he's actually saying, hey, fathers, like this is your job. 
This is the thing that you've been called to do. This is the thing that you've been commanded to do. He's going, hey, dads, pay attention right here because I'm talking to you. In other words, like this whole idea that, hey, it's mom's job to just simply raise the kids, and it's my job to make the paycheck, and I stay out over here, and mom takes care of the kids and everything right over here, and it's a separate world kind of a mindset. What he's saying right here is, no, dads, I'm talking here to you. This is a responsibility that has been given to you, not to the exclusion of moms, not the exclusion of ministers, churches, parents, other people in the community, anything like that, but he's saying, hey, dads, this is the thing that I've given you to do. You're the one he's commanded to teach your kids. And it's not to the exclusion of anything else, but he's going, you're the one who needs to be telling him about the beauty of his word is what he says here in Psalms. Uh, You're the one who's got to be telling him about the power of God and all the glorious things that he's done. In other words, you're the one that needs to be telling him that God is faithful. And here's what he's done in my life. And here's what he's done in your mother's life. And here's what he's done in your sister's life and your aunt's life and your grandma's life and your friend's life. And here's what I've seen him do years ago. And here's what I've seen him do this past week. And here's what I've seen him do this past month or whatever it may be. He's going, you're the one who needs to be talking about these things. You're the one who needs to be telling about his faithfulness because what they most need is not a paycheck. It's not this passing down of what your favorite hobby may be. It's not all of your knowledge of sports or your love for the Rangers or Cowboys or whatever your thing may be. Uh, what they need most is your attention and your intentionality and a father that's willing to come along and say, son, let me teach you. Daughter, let me teach you. And not only that, but I'm going to show you and I'm going to live this out, not in perfection, but simply in honesty and in vulnerability coming and saying, hey, let's come and let's do this thing together. I want to show you why it is that you see me worshiping on Sunday. It's not this mandate to come. You better get your butt in church and do your thing or else God's going to get you. But let me show you and tell you why he's worthy and why I've given my life to him. This father who's going to come alongside and say that you've got to understand that life is more than the ladder you're able to climb. It's more than the paycheck you're able to make. It's more than the team you cheer for that wins all the trophies and all the different things. But there is a day that you're going to come and you will behold him in all of his glory. And your life right now better make sense in light of that coming day. And so the psalmist is going to come and he's just going to say, teach him. Dads, and he's going to say, Pay, uh, specifically, I want you to know, you better teach them. They are paying attention and they're hanging on to your every word. And even more than that, they are watching the things that you do. And he's saying, take seriously this call to pass on the faith from one generation to the next. And here's why he says in verse 6, so that the next generation will know, even the children yet to be born. I love the fact that he's thinking about future generations. In other words, his mindset is not just right now. It's not just my immediate world. It's not just my immediate kids. It's not just my immediate life. It's so that my grandkids can come to the faith. It's so that my grandkids' grandkids can rejoice with us in heaven one day. It's so that the faith will continue to be passed on is what he says right there. And they in turn, he says, will tell their children and their children will tell their children. And he says in verse seven, then they will trust in God and keep his commands. And they won't become, verse eight, they won't become like their father's fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose heart was not steadfast and whose spirit was not faithful to God. In other words, maybe from the point of the the point of view of the psalmist right here, maybe the fathers fathers that he's talking about right there, maybe they were trying to teach it, maybe they weren't. Maybe they were bringing the kids to temple. Maybe they were teaching them Torah. Maybe they were teaching them the truths of God's word, but either way they're definitely not living it out in front of those kids. And so here's how he describes them in the rest of the psalm. Verse 10, the Ephraimites didn't keep God's covenant, but they refused to walk according to his law. And they forgot his works and the wonders that he had done. Verse 35, they remembered that God was the rock, the most high God, their redeemer. In other words, they knew the right things. They sung that song. They could check that box on the, on the test. But here it is. They flattered him with their mouths and they lied to him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast toward him. They were not faithful to his covenant. There's a handoff problem in the church back there. Verse 41, they tested him again and again. They did not remember his power. Verse 56, they did not keep his statues and they rebelled against the Most High and they acted like their fathers before them, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it because more than our words, our kids are always paying attention to the story of our lives. 
And you can never get away from that. And so the question we've got to be asking is, okay, what is the testimony of my life actually passing on? What is it teaching my kids, the people that are in my life, my friends, the people in my circles? What is the testimony of, uh, testimony of my life actually communicating to the people that I'm around? A few years back, I shared this painting from Norman Rockwell. I don't know if you guys remember this one. It's called Sunday Morning. Very, very famous painting that I think perfectly captures a little bit of kind of what we're talking about right here. But he kind of captured a lot of the, what he saw in his day, which is why he painted this picture. But you notice the picture is mom's got the kids ready for church. They're all prim and proper, ready to walk out. Dad's sitting there reading the paper in his pajamas, kind of hiding behind the church, getting there, sitting there going, oh, don't make me go, don't make me go, don't make me go. Where is the child looking in this picture? The little boy. He's looking at dad, isn't he? He's going, something's not right here. Mom's got us off going this way, and yet he's staying back. Why is it important over here? Why is it not important over here? Do you think that that might make an impact on what's happening in the home? Saying one thing with our words over here and doing something completely different over here. Church, we've got a handoff problem in the church. And it's not just the blatant hypocrisy that Rockwell, expose, Rockwell exposes and we talk about and we hear about a lot of times today. It's not necessarily those things. I remember Beth Moore talking about this a number of years back, but she talks about how in the early years before she kind of responded to her big call towards ministry, she talked about this message that she felt like the Lord was really doing something in her. But she says that she was in this time when everything that she was reading, all of the messages, she just kept hearing these messages about unbelief. Have you ever been there, done that, where it feels like, okay, everything I'm reading, every sermon I'm listening to, every podcast I'm hearing, it's that same dead gum theme day after day after day. God, what is it you're trying to teach me? And she says that whole time, like the theme was unbelief. And she's wrestling with God going, okay, Lord, what are you trying to teach me about unbelief? I believe in you. I've given my life to you. I know you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I am a believer in Jesus Christ. I want to make that very, very clear. Why in the world do you keep bringing this unbelief to me? And so she says this, she goes, it wasn't until I slowed down long enough to listen. This is right after a morning where the same devotional happened. She threw down the book and she goes, it wasn't until I slowed down long enough to listen that I was finally able to hear him say, I'm not asking you to believe in me. I'm telling you to start believing me. To not just believe the right things about me, but to start walking by the faith that you say that you believe. To believe me enough to set you free. To believe me enough to use you in mighty ways. To believe me enough to do exceedingly beyond anything you can ask or imagine. Instead of always praying those tiny and safe, tiny little prayers that you're so comfortable praying. And so she goes on and she writes that it was the stronghold of unbelief that he began breaking apart in me that day. This tactic of the enemy whereby he convinces you who already has faith. You who already have a, a faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This tactic of the enemy whereby he convinces you to only live by a little bit of that faith. And so she says, that's what I was afraid that I was passing on to my kids. This safe and comfortable, untrusting way of life, all wrapped up in the pretense of belief. And so the question we've got to ask is, what is the testimony of my life actually passing on to my kids? What am I teaching? What am I passing that on? Like, is it only my fear and anxiety? Is that the thing that I'm passing on to my kids? This untrust, God, you're not in control. I can't really let go and give you my future or the rest of my days. Is that the thing that we're passing on to our kids? Maybe it's a prayerlessness and a self-sufficiency that says, hey, here's the thing. You need the plan and you need the work ethic, which is great. That corresponds with our faith in a lot of different ways. But this prayerlessness and the self-sufficiency that says, guess what? Functionally speaking, I'm all we really need in order to succeed. Is that what's being passed on to our kids and to the next generation? Are we singing his praises on Sunday and going about and doing our own thing on Monday? Like, what is the testimony of our lives? Do my words here make sense over there when we're there at home? Maybe a great question to ask in the home. This is something that Brian uh, Radabaugh has always brought to our staff a number of times. But he says, it's good to every now and then ask the question, okay, what's it like to be on the other side of me? What's it like to be married to me? What's it like for me to be your father and to grow up in this home and actually listen to what they have to say? Because they can easily see the bumper stickers. They can easily see the t-shirts. They can easily see the plaques on the wall and, 
and all the right sayings and things like that, but can they actually see the difference that Christ has made in your life? The fruit of the Holy Spirit, an increase in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. Can they actually see the difference that Christ has made in your life? Can they actually see repentance taking place in your life? Like how else are we going to pass on the holiness of God if we never see fit to repent of anything? How else are we going to pass on the holiness of God if they've never seen you apologize or say the words, I'm sorry, or that anything in my life actually needs to change? Have they ever seen these elements of you whereby in posture or in literal posture, heart, whatever it may be, that we would get into a posture before God where we lay down and say, God, I am walking with you. I am laying my life down to you. Where I am today is not where I want to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, God. I am, being, I, I am offering myself as an offering to you, God. Would you come and have your way in me? Or do they see the fruit of repentance in your life? Can they see that He's also, can, can they see that he's all sufficient and satisfying? Or do they only see your joy about the latest victory or the latest, you know, Rangers win or whatever it may be? Do they understand that he's all sufficient and he's all satisfying every single day? How are they going to know his grace? Like if you're always holding a grudge. Like how are they going to know his grace if we're always talking bad about other people and never walking in the forgiveness which he's first given to us? told you before that one of the greatest lessons of grace that I ever saw was not a sermon. As much as I'd love to tell you that the sermons are all the thing and everything, uh, it was not a sermon. It was not a Sunday school lesson or anything like that. It was the grace I saw in my family extended as a somebody who did not deserve it. It was just after my grandmother had passed. She was killed by a drunk driver uh, almost 20 years ago. And uh, it was right after the funeral and my mother and my aunt and my uncle were going to meet the woman who had killed their mother. And they were having this meeting. You can imagine this woman was terrified at this meeting. And instead of coming with condemnation and harsh words and vengeance and spite and I'm going to get you and I'm going to tell you all the different things, uh, they were met with a hug. And church, how in the world are we going to pass on grace if we can't live it out? How in the world are we going to sing about it? What's going to happen to the next generation if we're singing about it but continuing to hold on to the grudges, continuing to hold on to the gossip? and the unforgiveness that we walk in all the time? How else are we going to pass on the faith unless our words align with our lives and and people see this thing? I mean, Paul's going to say, Paul's going to say, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, like, I know you're living in a time when no one believes what you do, and I know that you're living in a time when you're in the minority, and I know that you're living in a time when it's really, really hard to be a follower of Christ, but he's going, I need you to live out and be strong in this grace that you preach about every single day. Even if it takes you to prison, because you can't just teach it, you got to live it so that people won't just know about it, they'll actually believe it. And so he continues in his instruction to Paul, and he basically just says in verse 2, entrust it to them and teach it to qualified people who are also going to be able to teach it to others. And before we start freaking, about, freaking out about this admonition to teach other people, and you're sitting there going, hey, I'm not a teacher, that's those people over there, I'm not a speaker, I'm not great with my words, uh, I think it's good for us to understand that we teach every day, and that we already do this all the time, because we naturally teach what we know, and we naturally speak about the things that we love about. It's why it's easy to teach a young kid how to tie their shoes, uh, we, we do this all the time. We teach them how to clean their room. We teach them how uh, to learn the ABCs and how to do basic math or how to read and write, do addition, subtraction, how to mow the yard and not fight and be respectful and play sports and do nunchuck skills or whatever your thing may be. Uh, we, we, we know how to pass on the things that we know. And we really know how to pass on the things that we love. And so Paul gives us a little help in this. And this is one that I've held on to for a number of years, but to everyone who's sitting there kind of going, okay, hey, teaching's not my thing. I'm not the proclaimer. I'm not the wordsmith. I'm not the one who's memorized all the commentaries and all these different kinds of things. Paul uses two little words here that I've always found helpful in verse three. He tells Timothy this, join me in my suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In other words, you want to know how to make disciples and, and trust the faith well you start using these two little words with your kids or with your friends or the people in your life. Join me. I may not have it all figured out, but I'm inviting you to join me as we go and we figure it out together. You've got these questions about the word of God that I may not be able to answer. I don't know, and I'm not going to pretend that I know, and I don't have those commentaries. I don't have those commentaries memorized or anything like that, but I'm inviting you to join me. You don't know how to pray you don't know how to pray, join me 
and I'll show you how to pray. You don't know how to read the Word of God? Join me, and we'll read the Word of God together. I remember uh, my friend Matt Klingler years ago uh, taught this to me when I was a young seminary student. He was a singles pastor at Northwest Bible Church, and this was always kind of his, uh, his thing that he would always do with whoever it was, and it would be uh, people that had no idea of the Word of God, and he would just love to, he, he would say, hey, would you like to read the Word of God with me? Would you like to explore these things together? I'm inviting you. Would you just come and join me? I'm not coming and just going to tell it to you. I'm not going to sit there and preach it to you. But would you just come and join me and we'll learn these things together? I'm thinking of uh, the Moonies, the Botses. This past uh, Christmas, we were celebrating their families coming together and coming back from this mission trip down to Mexico. And this simple invitation to children and coming and saying, hey, come and join us. You've never engaged the mission of God before. Join me. I'll show you how we go and we love the poor. Join me, I'll, I'll, I'll come and I'll show you how we go and we share the faith. Join me and I'll come and I'll show you what God's doing all around the world. I know you don't know it. Guess what? I'm not an expert in it either. I don't have it all figured out. I haven't sold ever. I'm not going all the way around the world. I'm not that professional person that does that for a living or anything like that. But I am just simply inviting you. Would you come and would you join me and we'll do it all together? I'll tell you one of the things that I've been celebrating more than probably... Um, more than most around the church, there's a lot of things to kind of celebrate as a staff, but uh, one was just most recently, just what we've been seeing in the student ministry particularly. And many of you guys know this past year was a year that our youth ministry had grown to a point that kind of uh, junior high and senior high really needed to be separated. And so this past year, uh, they separated in a really uh, beautiful way, whereas Wednesday nights, the junior high comes and they meet in the early evening, and then the high school comes and they'll meet uh, right after the junior high does. And there's a lot of students, obviously, we've kind of loved the chemistry of everybody to being together and everything, but there's a lot of concern. Okay, what's going what's to be like when you're separating these two groups? And I'll just tell you one of the most beautiful things that we've seen is that this is a year when those high schoolers that have graduated kind of to the older and to the later hour on Wednesday nights, they're coming early to come in to be a part of that junior high group. And they're the ones that are leading those junior high small groups, and those are the ones that are teaching the lessons to those junior high students. Just stepping in and saying, I'm not too old, I don't have to, or I'm not too young to go and to pass on my faith to the next generation, to whoever's around me. Coming and saying, hey, I'm not the seminarian, I'm not the one who's done all these things, I don't have the whole thing figured out, no one does, but I'm just simply inviting you, would you join me, I'll show you what it is to follow Christ when you're in these junior high years. All I've got is a few years on you, but I'll come and I'll share with you what I have and what I know, would you come and would you join me and we'll do this thing together. I'm thinking of Luke Iatt, like inviting everyone that he ever meets to the student, high, student ministry and just coming and saying, just join me and just come and see and you'll discover what it is that we worship and why we do all these things. You don't know how to have a healthy marriage or how to have a healthy family. Come and join me and we'll show you and we'll do it together. I'm thinking of the Krupkeys and just faithfully walking with so many couples that are brand new in their marriages that are sitting there kind of going, hey, I've never been married before. Like that happens with all of us, right? I don't know how to do this thing. And, and someone else coming and saying, hey, we've been in it for about 20, 30, 40 years now, and, and we, we're a few steps ahead of you, and we don't have the whole thing figured out, but just come and would you join me? And we'll talk about this life. We'll talk about what it is to love a woman, what it is to love a man, what it is to give fully of yourself for the sake of her flourishing and for the glory of our God, what it looks like to, to pass on the faith to the next generation. Come and we'll talk about that, and we'll do this thing together to talk with your kids who are hung up on all kinds of apologetic questions like the problem of evil and things of that nature, and they're sitting there going, okay, I don't know about these things, the trustworthiness of the Bible, to come in and say, hey, join me. Uh, we'll read Tim Keller's Reasons for God together, one of the great modern apologetics books that are out there. I don't understand all these things either, but you're invited. Would you just come and would you join me? And we'll read some of these things. We'll talk about it, and we'll do it together. You don't know who you are. You're struggling with who you are. Join me. We'll talk about what God's word says is true about who you are. I know that there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of difficulty. There's a lot of external messages coming in saying, hey, you get to define who you want to be. You get to name what truth actually is. And that God didn't make you uh, who you are on purpose. That It was an accident and all these other kinds of things. Just join me.
and we'll explore the truth of God's word here together. Church, everything you need for life and flourishing, to know God well, do what he calls you to do and become more like him is right here in his Holy Spirit inspired word of God. And it is right there to pass on to your kids. Can you imagine what it would be like uh, to be able to have that conversation and just open it up? Be able to look at Genesis, which says that every man, woman, and child has been made in the image of God and has inherent dignity and value as such an image bearer of God. To be able to look at that and say, hey, just join me. I want to show you what the Word of God says is true about you. Meredith, I love what you said. You are beloved. You are safe. You are secure. You are all these other things. Let me show you in God's word what his word says is true about you. Do you think your children need to hear that over and over and over again? Join me. Dad, what about my life? Does it have any meaning or purpose? Join me. Let me show you in God's word. You are his workmanship. Paul says in Ephesians 2, created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of doing good works, which he's known about ahead of time in advance. In other words, he knew you in your mother's womb, and there is purpose in your life. What about the guilt and shame that I constantly feel on a regular basis? Like, am I, am I shamed and am I condemned by my actions? Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. But dad, how do I know that I'm loved? I don't feel like I'm loved. I don't feel like I'm worthy of love. And let me show you in God's word, God demonstrates his own love for you in this. While we were still sinners, Christ came and he died for you. But dad, am I able to love somebody I'm in disagreement with? Dad, it feels like I'm not able to love someone unless I completely affirm everything and we're on the same page and there's complete agreement about everything. Let me show you in God's word. Join me, son. Join me, daughter. We'll explore it here together. The truth of the gospel that when we were lost and far away, dead in our sins, while we were still sinners in disagreement with the holy God, he fixated his love upon you. In the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, to come and to do for you what you could not do for yourself so that you would be made right and brought into right relationship with him now and for all of eternity. It's all right here. But it takes men and women, moms and dads, friends and brothers and sisters that are willing to come and to not only teach the truth of God's word, but live it out in the context of community and this invitation that simply says, come and join me. We may not have it all figured out, but I'm inviting you to come and to join me and we'll do it all together. Timothy sa he says to Timothy, join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. Remember a few years back, one of our students who went off to the military came back after a couple of years. I hadn't seen him, and the dude had completely transformed. Like, I was like, Connor, it was Connor Davis. I was like, Connor, I don't even recognize you, man. You're huge. You went off to the military. You don't look like the same kid I knew in high school. I was like, what in the world happened, man? You look great. What's happening? And, and I love what he had to say. He's like, you know, you go out there, and there's no distractions whatsoever. No distractions whatsoever. That's what Paul's saying right here. Don't be entangled in civilian affairs. P try to please your commanding officer, the Lord Jesus Christ, is what he's talking about right here. All the push-ups, all the sit-ups, the running, the yelling, the screaming, the midnight swim. He said all of it was about the mission all the time. And so Jesus says, you want to know what the mission is? Go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing and teaching everything I've commanded you to teach. Barnabas picks up on that. He passes it on to Paul. Paul's picked up on that. He's passing it on to Timothy. Timothy picks up on that. He's passing it on to her, his church, and it goes on down from one generation to the next. I know it can be tough, he says, but just join me and we'll do it together. Like good soldiers of Christ Jesus. And church, that's how you entrust the faith. You don't just deliver it through your words. You don't just command it. You don't just yell it. My father, because your, your father told you to, because your mother told you to. No, 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 you, we teach it. And we entrust it to them by living it out in front of them. And through two little words, join me, and we'll come and we'll follow him together. And my hope and my prayer is that in 24, that this would be a year that you would make that invitation to someone around you. Maybe that is a son or a daughter who's still in your home, and they're a little one, and you still have them before they take off and go to a college and adult world and everything like that. My hope and my prayer, parents, that you would take seriously this call and this opportunity, the joy, passing on this faith from one generation to the next. You wouldn't just yell it and teach it, but that you would say it and live it with them. Join me. Let's do this thing together.
that maybe you're out there that you would look around you. Maybe you've got grandkids, maybe you've got friends, maybe you've got neighbors, and you've got community around you, that this would be a year that you would make that invitation to someone around you and consider the possibility that God may want to use you to help bring someone in further and further to the truth. Or maybe it is that you're just beginning this whole thing and that this would be a year when you respond to this invitation that's always been out there to join this group and to join a community, men's, women's, life groups, whatever it may be, that you would grow up in this thing together, all for the praise and for the glory of his name, that we would be a people that pass that baton on from one generation to the next. And so, Jesus, we just want to tell you, God, that we love you and we trust you this day, Lord. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that by your power that you would do a work here, God, where the faith really would be passed faithfully on from one generation to the next. God, that it wouldn't stop here. Pray blessing and favor over our kids. God, every young person here in this church, God, I pray that they would not only come to believe you, believe all about you, but God, that they would come to believe you for all the things that you want to do in their lives. God, that they would understand and believe that you want to do beyond anything they could ever hope or imagine. God, I pray that you would give us that faith. Pray blessing over them today. For the person that's come in today, Lord Jesus, and God, maybe you've been trying to get a hold of our attention for quite a while. Lord, I pray that we would respond today with a simple yes. Father, we will, we will step out in faith, and we will have those conversations, and we will be diligent and intentional to see you be glorified in the years to come. So church, I just want to give you a moment to just, would you sit and reflect what it is that God may be saying specifically to you this morning? It could be that you need to respond to that invitation and join a group. It could be that um, he's already put those people around you and that they're just waiting for you to come to them and very specifically say, would you just join me? I haven't always done it well, kind of blown it in the home. You've seen it. I'm not going to hide from it anymore. But God's done something in my life. And I just want you to join me in it. It could be a spouse. Maybe you guys have been distant and separated for a long time and you need to come and just say, I want you to join me in this. Let's grow together. So you just consider how God may use you to continue spreading the faith for generations to come. Would you just take a minute there and then we'll stand and we'll sing together in just a few moments.